as many of you know, I like to run. Um, and I like to run not because I have lofty goals. Uh, many of you are runners too, and some of you are training for marathons or have run many marathons or all kinds of that type of thing. I, I run for just a couple of reasons. Uh, one, I don't want to die young. Uh, two, I run because it's cheap. <laughs> You know, uh, no gym membership, no special equipment. You buy a pair of shoes once every six months or so, and the, then you're done. And I like the pace of life when I'm running. Uh, but I bore easily, so I'm always looking for a new place to run. So I live near the Cushman Trail, and so a lot of times I run the Cushman Trail, but I've run that 15,000 times, so I get a little tired of that. So I try other things, and every once in a while I'll run down in the harbor. And I do that and enjoy it until I remember how many other people are down there walking dogs and pushing strollers and that type of thing. But I, I don't know how many of you have ever noticed this, but the harbor is at sea level. Oh. I'll, I'll set it in for just a second. <laughs> and the rest of the area around the harbor is not. <laughs> Which means that there are a lot of hills. And so I run the hills too, just because I just want to push a little bit. So I've been up and down Soundview a hundred million times, been up and down Pioneer and Stinson, um, and those are always a challenge. Um, but I had one hill that was left on my bucket list, Peacock Hill. And I thought, I need to check that off of my bucket list. And Peacock Hill is not the steepest hill in the harbor. It's not even the longest hill in the harbor. But you kind of put them together and it's kind of a really steep, long hill. But I'm like, okay, I, I want to do this thing. I want to see if I can do it. And so a couple of weeks ago, um, I went and I ran Peacock Hill. And quite honestly, two or three times on the way up, I thought about quitting. But this is what made me push on. I knew that if I stopped and just laid down by the side of the road, some of you would drive by. <laughs> and you would see me lying there on the side of the road. And you would text me later, and you would say, saw you lying by the side of the road, honked and waved. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I thought, no, I've got to get to the top. And thankfully, those of you who did see me were like, wow, good job running up Peacock Hill. That's all I ask, a little affirmation every once in a while. <laughs> so now I've conquered Peacock Hill. And for some of you, it's no big deal. You're like, oh, yeah, I run up and down that six times before I go to work every morning. Uh, but for me, it was a pretty significant challenge. And I wanted to know if I could do it. And sometimes in life, any athlete knows that unless you test yourself, unless you push yourself, you'll never really know what you've got inside of you. And it's that idea of being tested to know what's inside of you, which is at the center of the story this morning. So in this story, this is again one of those portions of scripture where if you've been a Christian or been around the church for 30 or 50 years, you'll go, oh my gosh, I, I have that story memorized. I know that. But the danger of familiarity is that we never actually hear the story anymore. We know how it ends. And so it's just really easy to gloss over um, those parts of the story. And maybe this will be the first time you've ever heard the story, and so it will be pretty fresh. So if you've heard the story 50 times, what I want you to try and do this morning is to try and listen to it as if for the very first time. So here's the story. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here am I, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, the son that you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. 
But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. So there's a lot of really interesting things in this story. If you've heard the story enough, you probably don't even notice them anymore. But if you have never heard this story before, what's the big thing that stands out to you? This is the audience participation part of the sermon. What's the thing that really stands out in the story? He obeys his faith. Anybody a little bit taken back by human sacrifice? Are we into that? I mean, is that what we do? Is that what happens after you take the membership class? You know, you find out that there's a secret handshake. So yes, obedience. Yeah. But are we really killing our kids? I mean, that's horrific, right? Unless we're so used to the story, we don't hear that aspect of it anymore. God asks Abraham to sacrifice his son. He doesn't ask him metaphorically. He doesn't ask him, you know, something written is a nice story. The Bible is written to real people at a real place, at a real time, in a real context. And God says, sacrifice your son. Do we do that? I don't really understand what's going on here. In fact, this fits into a whole category of things that Michael doesn't really understand. Now, most of them, I can take a pretty good stab at, and I'm going to this morning, so no need to check out. But, I don't really get what's going on. I mean, why does God say to Abraham, sacrifice your son? I don't understand why God would ask this of Abraham. But sometimes, when there's something that we don't really understand, the way to understand it is through the lens of what we do understand. There's a lot about God that I don't understand, but there's a lot about God that I know. And so I take what I know about God and I use that to understand what I don't understand about God. So in your life, maybe there are questions that you have about why this thing or that thing has gone on. I don't understand why God wouldn't allow you to conceive. I don't understand why God would allow your child to die. I I don't understand why your cancer returned. I I don't understand why God would allow your retirement fund to collapse. I don't understand why God would allow you to get fired and not be able to provide for your family. I I don't understand any of those things. But I do understand a lot about God. And so I'm going to try and understand what I don't know about God through what I do know about God. And what I do know about God is God is loving and God is merciful. God is always working for my good and for your good. God has a plan and a purpose and God's plan and purpose is always redemptive. And so if I take that that I know about God and lay it over what I don't understand about my situation. It gives me some insight into going on. And the person who is like the primary example of this, the best example I know of in the Bible is Job. Job, if you read the story, everything bad that could happen to Job happens to Job. And yet Job has some of the greatest faith statements that are recorded in the entire Bible. Job says, even though God kills me, I'll still trust him. Job says, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And Job is either stupid or delusional 
or he has tapped into something deep about God. And that is that God isn't tied to our circumstances. And that God is always loving and God is always merciful and God is present with us in the stuff that we don't understand. I don't always get why th things are happening, but I know who God is and I'll cling to that. I will trust in that. And now we've come to what the core of the story is. Because essentially, God is asking Abraham, will you trust me? That's the question that God asks Abraham, but it's also the question that God asks us. And that has two shades of meaning, will you trust me? It can mean two very different and yet related things. It can be a question that you ask at the beginning of a relationship. We don't really have much history together, but will you trust me? It's an invitation into a trustworthy relationship. But you've got to kind of take a little bit of a step of faith there. Will you trust me at the beginning of a relationship? But the other side of that question is a question that's being asked after a lot of history. You and I have been through a ton together. You may not understand what's going on now and what the future looks like, but when you look over the past... Do you think you can trust me for the future? Two shades of meaning. Let me prove that I'm trustworthy, and I have proved that I am trustworthy. Which one is God asking here? Well, I think it's the second one. I've proved that I'm trustworthy, Abraham. And if you go back and read the whole story of Abraham, we don't have time to do it this morning, but it starts in Genesis chapter 12, and read through, Abraham messes up a lot. Abraham does not always get it right, which again reminds me that the Bible is written to real people in a real context. Abraham has a promise from God, a covenant relationship, and Abraham some days has faith that knows no bounds, and other days Abraham must get to the end of the day and go, what was I thinking when I did that? Abraham sometimes gets it right. Abraham oftentimes gets it wrong. In other words, Abraham is a lot like we are. Some days our faith knows no bounds, and other days we go to bed and go, dear God, what did I do? And it's into that that God asks the question, because Abraham has messed up a lot. And God is basically saying, I invited you into a relationship, and I made some promises to you, and you made some promises to me. And if we move forward, I need to know, can I count on you? Because in the past, you've been kind of iffy. And so you get this story to see if Abraham is up for the challenge. You get the story of God testing, which honestly, is what any of us would do if we wanted to see if we could trust someone. When our kids were little and we used to have babysitters, we never had a babysitter that we hadn't met before. We never had a babysitter that we didn't know what their family connection was. We never had a babysitter that a friend couldn't vouch for. We wanted to know if we could trust them or not. It's what any of us do when we start a relationship with a person. Are they trustworthy. Because you don't really know what's in a person until they're tested. I mean, think about marriages. I work with people in marriages all the time, and I watch marriages fall apart because of some really dumb choices that some people make. And you think, okay, here's this marriage, and it looks good. And the husband was really, really faithful to his wife, until this really beautiful woman got hired at his workplace. And then you got to ask the question, was he really faithful all these years? Or did he just lack opportunity? And I think the question is, he wasn't faithful, he just lacked opportunity. You don't know what a person is like until they're tested. Ray Johnston, a pastor friend of mine, says, people are like tea bags. You never know what's inside of them until you put them in hot water. You just don't know what people are really like until they're in a stressful situation. And then the real them comes out, out. Every athlete knows that you don't know what you can do. You don't know who you are until you're tested. Verse 2. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there. As a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. 
Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. I think that Abraham believes that Isaac will not be sacrificed. And here's why I think that. Because Abraham has a very specific promise from God. It's not only just that, um, that the promise will come to Abraham's offspring, but that it will come to Isaac. So Abraham knows that Isaac is God's chosen. Abraham comments to his servants, we're going to go off, but then we both are going to return again. And then you have this whole idea that some of the other surrounding cultures did practice child sacrifice, but the Hebrew people never did. In, in fact, the prophet Micah, when he's talking about sin, says, shall I sacrifice my firstborn to pay for my transgression, expecting that everybody is going to go, of course not. We don't sacrifice our kids. It's not what we do. I think what's happening here is that this whole thing is just taking longer than Abraham thinks it's going to. Have you ever had to wait patiently on God? Have you ever thought, I wish that God's timing was my timing? God's timing is never our timing. I think Abraham knows that Isaac isn't going to be sacrificed. But I think Abraham recognizes that he needs to respond in faith, which he does. It says, early the next morning, he gets up and he goes. He doesn't sleep in. He doesn't try and stretch it out. His first act is an act of faith. Okay, early the next morning, he sets out. And it notes that it took three days to get where he was going. Three days is the perfect time always in the Bible. Um, three days comes up again in some significant ways later on in the story. Um, and I got to believe that every morning... When Abraham woke up, he expected an angel to go, okay, good job. You can turn around and go back again. And he doesn't. Three days, and he gets to the mountain, and he looks up. Nothing from God yet. But he, got, but he keeps going, trusting that God is going to do something. And that's the trust that's required. That's how he passes the test. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife as the two of them went on together. Isaac spoke up and said to his, his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Isaac asked the question, where's the lamb? Is he just naive? Or does he suspect what's going on? Either way... He trusts his father and is willing to be obedient even to death. How else does Abraham bind him if Isaac doesn't go along with it? Abraham is, and Abraham got the promise from God that he was going to have a son the next year. He was 99 years old. So let's say that 10 or 11 years have passed. The biblical language is just after some time. So let's imagine um, and we know what's going on with Ishmael, that maybe Isaac is somewhere between 10 and 13 years old, which makes Abraham 110 plus. I'm pretty sure any 13-year-old can take a 110-year-old guy. The only way this happens is Isaac lets it happen. He trusts his father and is willing to be obedient even to death. There are some echoes there of something else. I mean, in theological language, it's type, anti-type. There's something going on here in this story that is going to figure very prominently in the New Testament story when there is another son who follows his father's will and is obedient even to death. When Jesus gets to the end of his life, he is still completely trusting of his father. He says in the Garden of Gethsemane, I'd rather not do this. If it's possible, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. And Isaac 
must say the same thing. He's the perfect sacrifice. He willingly lays down his life. And then God provides the lamb. And that's what God always does. So in this story, Abraham is called to sacrifice Isaac. Isaac willingly plays along. And right before it comes to the end, God provides the lamb. And the lamb stands in for Isaac. Just the way that a thousand or so years later, that God will provide the lamb again for us. That we will be in the place of we could have to pay the price. We could have to be responsible for all of the consequences of our own sin. Every stupid thing we've ever done. Every dumb thing we have ever said. But instead of us having to bear the consequences of all of that, God provides a lamb. And a sacrifice is made and God provides the sacrifice. Verse 11 But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its own horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. And there we get to the name of God. That's what the series is about. But not just so much about the name of God, because for me that's just, oh, isn't that interesting, ancient Hebrew. Um, But the name of God will always tell us something about the character of God. Because the names of God are given when God does something and he relates to people in a specific way. And that's what's really important to me in this sense. So the name that Abraham gives him in this place is um, Yahweh, which is God's personal name. We'll talk more about that next week. Before, it's always been El, kind of the generic name for God. Yahweh Ra'ah. And it's King James translated that as Jehovah Jireh for reasons I could tell you but won't be on the test. And what that means is the Lord sees. Ra'ah is Hebrew for he sees. Which then is really interesting because in a lot of the modern translations it is translated God will provide. When the root of the word is sees. And it's not so much that the translators are wrong. In fact, I think the translators are right and they're a lot smarter than I am. So who am I to say whether they're they're right or wrong? But but the root of what is going on is that God sees the situation that Abraham is in. God sees what the need is. God sees that they need to have something provided for them. And God provides that thing. It reflects back to, at the core of the passage is this idea that God will provide because God will see what needs to be done. And in this case, God will see that Abraham passed the test. And so that's all kind of wrapped up in there. God sees our lives, God sees what we need, and God provides what we need. God provides the strength for when we go through difficult times. God provides the sacrifice for our sin. And then God asks us the same question that he asked Abraham. Can you trust me? Will you trust me? Now, when God asked Abraham that question, Abraham knew exactly what was required of him. Because God said specifically, but what about us? What does God require from us? What is it that God expects? Well, I can remember when I was in high school and college, I spent a lot of time agonizing about what was the will of God for my life. And, you know, it it was kind of like I looked at the will of God as like being a freeway off-ramp. And if you didn't get take the right off-ramp, you were just stuck on there for miles longer and you had just missed the will of God. I don't think it's that complicated. Although I celebrate people who are so concerned about having God's word for their life. I don't think it's as much, what God wants from us, I don't think it's as much of a mystery as it might seem. Uh, We could go really deep, particularly with application, but let me lay it out like this. What does God require of us? He requires us to love God, 
with all of our hearts, minds, souls, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. We can go into a lot more deal than, uh, detail than that, but for today, that's a good starting point. So we can, in every situation, ask, is this loving? Is this loving towards God? Is this loving towards other people? And that might look like, can I see beyond the end of my nose to see how other people are living? Because we live under very unique conditions here in our little corner of the world. We have unique pressures. Everybody struggles with some things. But, you know, here the pressure is to have more. Here the pressure is to take, uh, you know, more care of ourselves, to do more for us, to collect more stuff. And sometimes the loving thing is to look beyond our own personal needs and look at the life situations of other people. Every Advent, uh, at our Advent kickoff, uh, we do a service project for other people. We've worked with foster kids for a while, and this year we're going to work with families who are living below the poverty line. Not families who are living below the poverty line in King County, not families who are living below the poverty line on the hilltop, families who are living below the poverty line within a two-mile radius of this church. In Gig Harbor. And the loving question that will come to us is, as we plan our holiday parties, as we plan the clothes that we want to buy, as we plan our holiday trips, as we plan our holiday food, as we plan the gifts that we want to give one another, will we be able to see beyond the end of our own nose and see our neighbors in need? And what will our loving response be to that? Is it loving? It might look like my natural inclination is to do this. But I'm going to stop. And before I act, before I say something, I'm going to ask God, God, what's your heart here? How is your heart beating for this issue? What's the choice you would make here? That's the loving thing. Will you trust me? Can you trust me? Will you allow me to show you that I'm faithful and trustworthy as much in the future as I have been in the past. The question still comes down to us. And it comes down in both of those situations. In a congregation our side, we have people all over the spectrum. We have people who are just beginning or are considering beginning a relationship with Jesus. And the question that comes to us is, do you think you can trust me? I mean, maybe based on the other directions that you've gone that have not paid off so well. Do you think you can trust me more than you did everything else that, that you tried? And that requires a different faith uh, commitment. And then there's others of us that are further along on the spectrum. And there are times where we can look back and we wonder where God was. Some of us deal with tremendous pain and hurt and baggage in our lives. And maybe you're still asking that. God, I went through this thing and where were you? But there are also going to be times where you knew that you knew that you knew that God was present. And you found him to be faithful in your situation. And so the question from God to us in that situation then is, will you look at the ways that I have been faithful, even when you don't understand? And can you trust me for the present? Can you trust me for the future? So I've got three questions that I want you to think about for a moment. The first is, if the tea bag test was done on your life, what would it show was inside of you? The second is, what's an example of God's faithfulness in your life? So imagine that, I'm not going to do this, so you know, don't get up and leave. But imagine that I said, turn to your neighbor and share a time that God was present and faithful to you. I'm not going to do that, but, but what would you say? That's how to answer that question. And the third is, how can that memory of God's faithfulness help you trust God as you move forward? Let's take about 30 seconds and let's pray and consider those things. Let's pray together.
Loving God, if the question is, will you trust me? I pray for the people who either don't have a relationship with you or have just the beginning of a relationship with you. And God, as you ask them whether or not they'll trust you, would you give them the ability to say, I'll give it a try. I'll give it a try. And if that's you this morning, I hope that that's your answer. Um, that, that you would be willing to give God a try uh, to find out whether or not he really will be trustworthy to you in the way that he's been trustworthy to so many other people in this room. Um, and the way that you start a relationship with God or further it on is simply to ask him to come into your life. Um, it can be as simple a prayer as, uh, God, I've tried a lot of other things that don't seem to be producing the results I'd like to see in my life. And so now I would love to find out if you're faithful. So I want to follow you. Um, I would like Jesus to come in uh, to my life. And God will honor that prayer. And he will begin a new life for you where, he, where you can discover God's faithfulness. God, others of us need to look back over our lives and remember where you were faithful to us in the past. Uh, God, some of us have great trauma in our past. And we are still asking the question, where was God in the midst of that? And we may never have the answer that we want. But God, would you help us to be able to look at the times where we knew that we knew that we knew that you were there and that you were present, that you were the God who sees us and that you were the God who continues to provide so that we can trust you moving forward. In Jesus' name, amen.